Thank you so much for that kind introduction, and uh, thank you very much to SBIA, who always do a, a wonderful job orchestrating this, uh, I think, really helpful and uh, an impactful uh, meeting. So jumping straight into it, uh, I'm Sam Rani. I'm the lead for topical and transdermal products uh, in the Office of Generic Drugs, and I'll be leading us into this session on the scientific and regulatory advances uh, for generic topical and transdermal drug products. I'll begin by talking about our research activities and how this has led to scientific advances that have modernized our bioequivalent standards for topicals and transdermals. I'll begin, of course, by saying that um, uh, this presentation reflects uh, my views and not those of the agency. So one of the goals of our Godufa research program is to enhance patient access to generic drug products, high quality, affordable generic drug products. Well, how do we enhance patient access? By overcoming barriers that have traditionally limited generic drug development. And how do we overcome those barriers? By utilizing scientific evidence to establish efficient, modern bioequivalent standards. So the question is, where does this evidence come from? Well, it's because we continually study, learn, evolve, refine, and harmonize our bioequivalent standards. And so that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about during the course of today's meeting. There's a, a rhythm, a, a pattern to what we continually do, and it begins with research. That research then leads to results, which in turn give us the evidence to develop our alternative bioequivalence approaches. Those are then published in product-specific guidances. And as we review multiple products and develop multiple guidances, we can then generalize uh, the science to harmonize our bioequivalent standards. And then as we put those out and receive comments from industry and study matters further, that leads back to more research questions and the cycle continues. And I'm going to talk a little bit to illustrate how this has worked and how it has really helped to move things forward uh, during the GDUFA cycles that we've had so far. Uh, where we stand today is a result of the cycles of research we've been doing. And one of the most impactful things that have come out of that is a modular framework for in vitro characterization-based bioequivalence evaluation. This, the modules of this are essentially founded upon uh, a comparison of the qualitative and quantitative sameness of the generic product, the prospective generic product, compared to the reference product, as well as on physical and structural sameness and equivalence of drug release and, and drug permeation through skin, which are typically measured by IVRT and IVPT studies. Of course, this is just one part of the framework. Uh, we have multiple approaches by which B can be evaluated, including in vivo pharmacokinetic studies that can complement a characterization-based approach, and pharmacodynamic vasoconstrictor studies for corticosteroids, uh, comparative clinical endpoint studies, and in silico quantitative methods, including modeling and simulation, which can also complement characterization-based approaches. Now, at the heart of this is the characterization of the dosage form. And so I'm going to take a moment here to talk about what has been an evolving concept for topical dermatological products. Q1 sameness, Q2 sameness, and Q3 sameness. So Q1 sameness, for those of you who may not be familiar, refers to having the same components in the test or prospective generic product as in the reference product, meaning the same ingredients. Q2 sameness is built upon that, having not only the same components, but also the same formulation, the same composition as the reference product. And Q3 sameness builds upon Q1 and Q2 as having not only the same components and composition as the reference product, but also the same physical and structural properties. Now, there are some tolerances to each of these. For example, with Q1 sameness, we typically allow for variations in an ingredient where they comply with the same compendial standard. So for example, there may be two carbomers that meet the same compendial monograph, the same compendial standard, uh, but perhaps the, the older one was manufactured traditionally with a benzene and might have some residual benzene, uh, but the new one is manufactured without that. It meets the same compendial standard and, and might be considered as, uh, as a reasonable um, substitute for that. In fact, even though a product label for a reference drug may indicate that it uses the old carbomer, in fact, it may just not have been updated. Q2 sameness also has some tolerance where we might potentially allow for a difference in the nominal amount of a pH adjusting agent where everything else is matched up, but the amount of pH adjusting agent to actually really match that Q3 uh, might be slightly outside plus or minus 5%, and that might be allowable. And similarly, with Q3 sameness, 
we generally allow for variability within the range characterized for batches of the reference product. So, for example, the rheology of one batch to another batch of the reference product may exhibit a certain range. And you know, within that range, a product would typically be considered the same if it matches within that range. The underlying assumption here is that for the same reason that we don't need to re-demonstrate the safety and efficacy of the reference product every time a new batch of the reference product is manufactured, uh, if the generic product matches the reference product as identically as batch to batch of the reference product is identical to itself, then we can reasonably assume the same safety and efficacy profile. Now, this all really relates to what you're comparing to the reference product. So I want to take a moment here to talk about the reference product. Bioequivalence is implicitly demonstrated with respect to the reference listed drug product, the RLD product. However, that may not always be on the market. It uh, may be discontinued even. And so topical dermatological test products may be compared to the designated reference standard product, which you can identify in the orange book, uh, to support a demonstration of bioequivalence. Now, this applies to in vitro as well as in vivo characterizations of topical dermatological product quality or performance to support a demonstration of VE. So let's talk also a little bit about product quality and performance and the relationship between them, because that's been a big part of what we've researched over the last several years. Some of you may be familiar with the work that we began a few years ago with acyclovir cream products, where we evaluated uh, multiple acyclovir cream products and evaluated their components and composition and um, is the mouse working? And you can see here that the three green products are the reference products marketed in different regions, uh, where I don't expect you to see what's on the individual lines because those are the components. Components, ingredients on the same line are matched ingredients. What you can see here is in the first column, that's the US marketed product, and it's compositionally different than the same product marketed in, the, in different parts of Europe. Uh, the two pink ones are Austrian generics, and you can see compositionally they differ from all of the reference products. Uh, at the bottom, we have Q3 characterizations where the Q3 characteristics are very similar for all three reference products, but different than the, than the, uh, than the two uh, generics, which are similar to each other. So what we see here, there's a broader trend that I want to focus on, is that the performance of the uh, reference product, which we see at the top there, uh, the top uh, curve. So these are the cutaneous pharmacokinetics of the reference product in the top. And I'm going to try to use the pointer. I'm not sure if you can see it. So these are the reference products. They all have very similar Q3, and they have a similar performance. At the bottom here, we have, in fact, I'll, I'll be able to do it this way. All the reference products are uh, similar composition, uh, sim compositionally, but not the same. And they have uh, similar Q3 characteristics, and we see similar performance. Likewise, for the two Austrian generics, they have similar Q3, uh, not necessarily the same composition, similar perhaps, and similar performance. We've seen this again with other drug products like metronidazole creams, where the composition may not be identical, but it may be similar. The Q3 char characteristics are similar, and the performance is similar, likewise for metronidazole gels. And we've seen this consistently with multiple products that we've looked at, where we need a Q3 concept to understand what is it. If it's not Q3 sameness, which it clearly isn't, that controls whether a product will perform the same way, then what is the Q3 concept that really tells us whether the product performance is going to be the same? And I focus on Q3 because Q3 is built upon the components and composition as well. What these all have in common is that they're not necessarily Q1 and Q2 the same. However, there's no significant impact on bioavailability. So the science, our results, are telling us that we need to continue evolving our concept for topical dermatological products, where certainly what's on the screen here of Q1, Q2, Q3 sameness is the sweet spot from a regulatory consideration. That's our safe space to be in. But evidence is telling us that Q3 similarity can provide a product that matches. Uh, in terms of its performance, uh, where Q3 similarity is something we'd like to begin thinking about as a distinct concept from Q3 sameness. Here, Q3 similarity has similar components and composition and similar physical and structural properties. And there is no regulatory basis to require that topical dermatological drugs 
must be Q1 and Q2 the same. Instead, what's, what really matters is that there is no difference in the inactive ingredients or other aspects of the formulation like Q3 relative to the reference product that may significantly affect local or systemic bioavailability. And Q1, Q2 sameness is an example of that, but it's not necessarily the only way that it can be done. Now, certain bioequivalence approaches may generally be alternatives for topical dermatological drug products. For example, a characterization-based bioequivalence approach is a generalizably uh, applicable approach as our comparative clinical endpoint studies. And I wanted to offer this point because not all of the product-specific guidances that we have out there may necessarily include the details for a characterization-based approach. However, an alternative approach is typically uh, available. And often, as we're updating guidances, we may not be able to put the in vitro option in the revised guidance, but we try to include a notation that applicants can submit a pre and a meeting request uh, to discuss an alternative approach. And certainly, a characterization-based approach can be one of them. So I want to move forward now to how does the cycle move forward? Our FY18 research priority, which is developed based upon input from, uh, from, uh, from the industry and from the public, is to expand the characterization-based bioequivalence methods across all topical dermatological drug products. And that's a lot of different classes of products here. We've got solutions, sprays, creams, lotions, ointments, gel, shampoos, foams, tapes. I mean, there's a long list in this transdermal products as well. But we absolutely believe that this is an incredible priority, and we're committed to making this happen. I'm going to offer a few examples of a few different types of areas where our research is moving forward. Uh, the first example is solution-based dosage forms. Now, both some topical solutions or solution-based foam aerosols may qualify for a waiver of an in vivo evidence of BE. And per the CFR, uh, what is essentially the basis for this is that there should be no inactive ingredient or other changes in the formulation that may significantly affect the systemic or local bioavailability. So that's great if you can, if you basically, in your, if you're in that sweet spot, that's great. But what if you're compositionally different? Compositionally different solution-based products can have some pretty complex BE issues related to either the formulation components and composition. If it's a different composition, it may have a different irritant potential. Uh, the product quality attributes in terms of pH, rheology, drug solubility may be different, and that could affect bioequivalence or therapeutic equivalence. Uh, the product performance in terms of its metamorphosis, its evaporative rate, uh, drug delivery could be different. And similarly, if the container closure system, if the, if the evaporative loss through the container is different, that could have some physical stability or dispensing issues. So there are issues for, for solution-based dosage forms, even though there are typically waivers that would be available. And one example of the, the kind of research we're doing here is in a research project uh, that uh, is the first bullet point where we're characterizing the critical properties that modulate the metamorphosis and physical stability of topical foams so we can really focus on this class of products so we understand what Q3 characteristics really matter and control the performance. Also, I think one of the most fascinating ones is that we're characterizing the thermodynamic properties that modulate bioequivalence for compositionally different topical products. Now, this research initially focuses on simple solutions and solution-based dosage forms, but it will progress into compositionally different, different semi-solid dosage forms. And this is really going to be fascinating because it helps us to understand, you know, as part of this work, where do we define the boundaries of Q3 similarity? Another example is for petrolatum-based ointments. Uh, there are some topical ointment formulations that are comprised predominantly of white petrolatum. And uh, you might say, well, it's a simple formulation then, but despite the apparent compositional simplicity, these products can have some complex bioequivalence issues that are related to the compositional heterogeneity of white petrolatum, which is really a heterogeneous mixture of molecular hydrocarbon species. And so there are failure modes for bioequivalence that depend upon that petrolatum composition and on the source of the, the petrolatum. Also, there are broad overlapping compendial specifications where the compendial monographs and the specifications therein for petrolatum and white petrolatum overlap almost entirely. So we had some research in this area that's currently evaluating tests to characterize that compositional heterogeneity and the physical properties, the Q3 attributes of petrolatums and petrolatum-based ointments uh, that may have the potential to influence B. And one of the things that we've seen is that there are several tests in the USP monograph 
for white petrolatum or for petrolatum. And all of those tests are excellent tests that can be performed on the finished dosage form and can be used to compare different sources of petrolatum. Uh, but in the monograph, the acceptance ranges are very wide for each test. So just by being in grade, uh, individuals have found or companies have found that just being in grade petrolatum USP or white petrolatum USP doesn't necessarily give you the same performance in a topical dermatological product. One of the things that can be added to that test, set of tests is GCMS. And so what we see here is some data uh, where this is the blank and, and the standard. The standard includes multiple individual hydrocarbons as sort of a, a, a standard curve or a ladder. And then below that, you see three uh, ointments, petrolatum-based ointments, that look similar, but the performance of the middle one is very different. There's a much higher permeation from the middle one of those three. And if you look here, you'll notice that there's actually an enrichment in the C10 to C8 to C10 hydrocarbons, which are right there where permeation enhancers in that uh, hydrocarbon chain length uh, operate. So what we see here is that there are impurities, you might call them, or, or species within the hydrocarbons that are actually uh, different. And it actually explains why the permeation from that product is quite different. Similarly, we uh, saw with another set of products that uh, a product that had a very different hydrocarbon heterogeneity also had a distinctly different uh, performance in terms of permeation. The third example that I'll offer is for topical or transdermal delivery systems. We call them TDS. Uh, it used to be that the studies that were performed to support a demonstration of bioequivalence varied substantially for different TDS products, even in the product-specific guidances, uh, the older ones. Uh, in fact, there were some aspects of the study designs that ended up confounding the ultimate assessment of whether or not the clinical performance was comparable. Also, the statistical analyses that were utilized to evaluate non-inferiority, whether for adhesion or for irritation, sensitization, uh, those analyses exhibited very low power and required large subject populations to meet statistical endpoints. And we've done a massive overhaul in the last year where we comprehensively reviewed every single product and reconsidered and updated, revised, clarified, and standardized the BE recommendations for all the TDS products, for all generics, issuing new and revised guidances for industry. These are general guidances, uh, new and revised product-specific guidances that essentially cover almost every single reference product now, uh, more powerful statistical analyses, and enhanced flexibility to utilize alternative scales, and which we continue to be interested in researching, as well as more efficient and better controlled in vivo study designs. So with that, I'd like to leave you, and I hope uh, that the, I've laid a foundation for the next three talks, which will now offer a little bit more detail about some of the specifics in these areas. Uh, and I hope that you can see that we are absolutely committed to identifying opportunities for strategic research that supports the development of evidence-based, efficient BE standards, um, that we're also committed to reviewing, revising, maintaining, and modernizing our BE recommendations to ensure that they always reflect our current thinking, which is based upon continually advancing scientific knowledge, and that we're really committed to harmonizing bioequivalent standards within classes of topical trans and transdermal drug products to improve the consistency and the predictability of regulatory expectations. This is an enormous amount of work that's happening at the agency with a great number of people, only a few of whom are, are actually listed here from not only the Office of Generic Drugs, but also the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, and there's are many others within the Center uh, for uh, uh, Drug Evaluation and Research. So with that, I'll say thank you very much. It's been my privilege to speak about this, and I look forward to taking any questions you have during the panel discussion.